Well, hi and welcome. You're listening to Victory Chicks Radio with me, Anne Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl, lifestyle expert, victory strategist, and your empowerment partner. And this is where us Victory Chicks, and you guys who care about us, meet to chat about things we can do to make our lives better and more fulfilling and give us a little more jazz and sparkle. Thanks for joining me today at today's Victory Chicks Radio Show. Today is such a fun show and just in time for Groundhog Day. When I was a kid, my mother always made a big thing of Groundhog Day. I'd be getting dressed and I'd come down on my to have breakfast before I go to school and there'd be some oatmeal waiting and a glass of orange juice and some vitamins and my mother would say good morning and then say, the groundhog was here and he saw a shadow, six more weeks of winter. And it took until about a couple of years ago to realize that Groundhog Day is always February 2nd and spring always starts on March 21st. And that's six weeks. There's always six weeks more of winter. But whoever ran the Chamber of Commerce in Punxsutawney was thinking a good thing when they started this out so many years ago. Well, about a year ago, my spouse Joseph and I traveled from our home in Chester County, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour west of Philadelphia, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is on the other side of our beautiful state of Pennsylvania. The GPS, I think we were using Waze that day, took us to Penn State, and I was already dreaming about tasting some of that fabulous Penn State creamery ice cream. You Penn Staters know it's the best ever. But then the GPS diverted us around the college town, apparently because the traffic to Penn State for the home game was crazy. Then we weren't going to get to the creamery, and I was disappointed to have to give up my idea for ice cream until I got out a map. Yes, I still use maps because I know how to read one. So I got out a map, and that's when I realized we would be going right past Punxsutawney on our way to Pittsburgh. And geez, I just had to make a stop there. And Joseph, I promised him we'd have lunch when we got there. He was good with it. So we traveled from Penn State to Punxsutawney. And do you remember that old movie Groundhog Day? That was the one where Bill Murray was the television weatherman in Pittsburgh. And each year, his station made him do a Groundhog Day segment. And in the movie, it was his fourth year doing it, and he just hated making that two-hour drive from Pittsburgh to Punxsutawney. And he wasn't so crazy about the town either. But here's what I learned that was so interesting. That movie, Groundhog Day, was not filmed in Punxsutawney. Bill Murray had been there. He stayed at the one and only hotel that, that in Punxsutawney. But the producers and directors, or whoever is making that decision, decided that Punxsutawney didn't look Punxsutawney enough. And so it was actually filmed in a small town outside, I think it was Chicago. So when you're watching Groundhog Day, you're not watching the real Punxsutawney. But where you might see the real Punxsutawney is in the TV show Breaking Amish. And for those of you who have never seen it, It's a story about four Amish kids who are taking their year sabbatical from Amish land, and the TV show takes them and puts them in New York City to see how they fare. It's their year that they can be with the English, so they get to go back to Amish land, which in the show is Punxsutawney, at least in the first couple seasons. So if you watch Breaking Amish, you were actually looking at Punxsutawney. Well, anyway, I loved the town. It was such a cute, charming little town. Joseph and I had lunch at Punxsutawney Phil's Diner. We took pictures of several of the huge groundhog statues in town. And of course, we spent time on the groundhog stage, which, by the way, isn't right in the town. We asked the waitress at at Punxsutawney Phil's and she said, well, you make a left out of here, you go across the bridge, you have to go down past the Walmart, and then you make a right-hand turn at some street and just take that down and and then you'll see it. It was like the kind of directions I get when I go to Jersey. But we did find it. And it's way bigger than I thought. What you see on TV is just a tiny little stage. But it's a big open space like a park. There's a building there where there might be a VFW hall. And on the day we were there, there was a meeting there. There are walking trails. And from going from the parking lot to the stage, there's like an aisle with uh, railings on either side. 
And on the day that we were there, there was white netting. So I wrapped around the railings and I thought, oh, they must have weddings here. And the stage is not terribly big, but it's big enough to look good in the, in the, on the TV show. And of course, Joseph and I took pictures on the stage, on the side of the stage, and by the log that Punxsutawneyville comes out of. We were so touristy and we had such a good time. And I just love that little town of Punxsutawney. If you ever get a chance, it's not a destination. You wouldn't go there and stay for any length of time. But if you're on your way to Pittsburgh, we met a bunch of guys who were coming from whoever Penn State was playing that day, someplace in the Midwest, and they had stopped in Punxsutawney. So if you're coming in either direction and you get a chance to, to see it and see the Punxsutawney Phil stage, it's worth a little side stop. But you know, when I got home, I got totally obsessed with Punxsutawney and Punxsutawney Phil that I went to my girlfriend Google and I found out that Punxsutawney Phil has his own inner circle and a handler. And that handler stuff in the inner circle gets passed down from generation to generation And our guest today, A.J. DeRoom, took over from his father, and I believe his father took over from his grandfather. So A.J. DeRoom, he's so cute. He's Phil's handler, and he's a mover and shaker in the Punxsutawney Phil inner circle. So I asked him to join us today, and I talked with him earlier this week. He has so much good stuff to tell us. It's such fun about Punxsutawney and about Groundhog Day that I just can't wait for you to meet him. So let's have some fun as we get ready for our February 2nd weather forecasting event, Groundhog Day. Welcome to Victory Chicks Radio, A.J. DeRoom. I'm so happy you joined us today. I'm glad to be here too, Anne-Marie. Thanks for having us on. Oh, I'm glad. A.J., listen, I was in Punxsutawney in in October, and I thought it was a charming town with a park that has, this fascinates me, a real-life bandstand that's something right out of that old movie, The Music Man. Do you know? Do you know the movie I'm talking about? I do. Uh, we watched it in. I'm going to say eighth grade. We had we did a unit in my mu- the music class I had on on the Music Man. So I I know all about River City. So there you go. So so that's your town reminds me of that with the bandstand, and uh, and you know if somebody was just passing through and didn't know where they were, it would take them a split second to figure out that they were in Punxsutawney because tell me if I'm saying this right, Mahoning Street. Mahoning. Mahoning Street. Wait, that's Punxsutawney's Main Street. It's lined with these bigger than life and creatively painted groundhogs that it you is. all that you It's all not only Main Street, they're all over the place. They're, uh, they are. Yeah, they did like a big uh, uh, fundraising event um, years ago. And it was kind of the same time, and I don't know if they still exist. There was like those, I think there were cows that were all over New York, or maybe it was Philadelphia. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, and in, in Maine, they're lobsters, yeah. Yeah, and we just kind of had a play on that and did Groundhogs here and different businesses and some commu- community organizations, actually the Groundhog Club as well, because we, we actually weren't even the owners of that project. It was uh, it was a group of just, uh, there was, I think, one guy from the Groundhog Club that was on the group that put that together. Hmm. We did become owners of it somehow this year, uh, so we now maintain them and, or, or, I guess, manage the maintenance of them. Uh, but, yeah, it's pretty cool, pretty cool thing. And you know, AJ, you call them fantastic fills. You know, yeah. in this part of Pennsylvania, we have a whole different meaning for fantastic fills, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you do, but <laughs> we wouldn't, we, you know, we're a little too far west for that. We're more into penguins in this direction. <laughs> That's, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, but you know what, AJ, those, the, those fantastic fills, I'm one of the people who stood next to one and got my picture taken with him. My spouse did also. In fact, I posted one on today's radio wrap up of not me, but with my spouse. Do a lot of people do that? Take their pictures with the, one of the fantastic fills? It is a big deal around here. Yeah, it's one yeah. of the things that people love to do. They are. I mean, there's some really, really cool ones. So, uh, I mean, I can't blame them. I've had uh, my picture taken with people in front of many of them too. So. I believe that. Yeah, it's the one that we took was the, the one that was near where the bandstand was because I like that one the best. That one is the Groundhog Clubs. That's uh, that's the one that is near Phil. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's ours. Yeah, oh, nice. that one's had a couple. Uh, it's went on a couple road trips actually. <laughs> really? um, a different. Um, um, uh, they used it for a movie, and I, I can't remember what the deal was, but they actually like rented it from us. They came in, they put it on a truck, they hauled it out there, and uh, used it for a summer. 
fast and then mailed it back to us. Oh, so it's, so it's, it's, it's been worldly. Well, you know, A.G., before we talk about the punks about, about Groundhog Day, I wanted to ask you some questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we talked the other day, you told me that at least when you were growing up, Punks of Honey had a strong ethnic background. Tell me about that. It does. It still does today. Um, uh, the, the Punks of Honey um, had its – it started as a lumber town. Uh, like a lot of towns in Pennsylvania, you know, well, in the you know we were the frontier, I guess, back in those days. Uh, you know, this part, this was this was out west, <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. you know, it started as a lumber town, and they pretty much clear cut like everything out here over the years. And the next thing that sort of happened around Punxsutawney was coal, and it was really uh, one of the coal centers for what fed the Industrial Revolution down in Pittsburgh and 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 uh, in Buffalo and different uh, cities where the steel mills were. Well, mm-hmm. most of the coke came from our area huh. and so every town within like three miles that we consider i mean they're all the punksy school district they kind of feel like they're punks 20 but there are these little towns like within three miles of punksy like the suburbs and every one of them is either and if you know or was an italian mining town or a hungarian mining town or a polish mining town or or, or something like that so we all grew up with uh, you know with friends and family that came from these really strong ethnic towns and so the food around here i mean you know we're like you know pierogies are big but also lasagna is big and spaghetti and meatballs and mm. and then you know we've got pugich and we've got uh halushki and i mean all these things are it's so it's all like a melting pot at this point so you go to someone's house for like a wedding or uh or uh you know for a birthday or whatever it doesn't matter there's like something from all these different nationalities it's all mixed in i love, that. I love it kind of, yeah yeah, cool. and I was looking online, and first of all, you're not far from Indiana, which was the birthplace of Jimmy Stewart, and there's a big museum there. And um, this is what I didn't know. You, there's a lot of, like, there's a, um, a wine tour. Like, there's yeah. a lot of vineyards you have there. There are. This um, this area is, is uh, it's, it's pretty good for growing grapes. It's sort of similar, uh, you know, the, the, what they say, the Appalachian of this area is similar to, you know, the southern New York stuff. So it's not as big as that area that, you know, uh, up in northeast and Erie, up swinging up through there where the, the Welch's vineyards are and stuff. But but it's still pretty decent. And uh, so, yeah, there's, I mean, there's more than a dozen wineries around us that uh, a lot of them actually make some groundhog wine as well, which is pretty cool. So. Oh, that is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, AJ, I was every time every time uh, Groundhog Day comes around, I think I don't know who thought this up, but they are a marketing genius, and it's been around. Has, am I remembering this correctly? But since the 1800s. Yeah, 1886 or 1887 wow. maybe was the first mention of it. 1886 is when uh, when when our lore kind of started for the Groundhog Club. They were celebrating it or thinking about it before that, but it started to become organized at about that point. Who thought it up? Is it, is it accredited to any one person? Well, it, it, it is. Um, the, uh, there was a, there was an, the, well, there was a groundhog club, and they were actually hunters uh, who did kind of like a game feast mm-hmm. every year, mm-hmm. and they would go around in the fall and hunt groundhog, and then uh, that, that was dinner. And there was... Uh, the editor of the Punxsutawney Spirit, which is, was our newspaper at the time, actually still is today, uh, he he kind of grabbed a hold of that. And at the time, too, like, you got to think about what was going on in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was, uh, the cities weren't all quite cities then, and, and there was lots of towns vying for, uh, to be the next big city in Pennsylvania. Mm. And Punxsutawney was one of them, especially with the burgeoning uh, coal industries. And so, and railroad, and so this guy, he kind of grabbed onto this groundhog uh, lore of, you know, the groundhog predicting the weather and Candlemas mm-hmm. Day. And mm-hmm. that was a German tradition that people, like I said, kind of thought about and took these groundhog hunters and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to do something with this. And so they basically started doing it as like a publicity stunt in the newspaper. He would, he would report on it and uh, on, on what the groundhog did on February 2nd. And... Our tradition as the Groundhog Club kind of grew out of those beginnings. And and I'm guessing that it's, see, I always thought it was somebody from the Chamber of Commerce because it, uh, because it has to be a big boost to your local economy. Oh, for sure. But that, he probably wasn't, as, well, the Chamber of Commerce actually, I just read this and I should know, but it, I don't believe it existed yet. 
in Punta mm-hmm. Tony. Uh, but he would have been one of the guys that would have been, I mean, the newspaper, obviously, in the late 1800s, I mean, even still today, is a big deal in our town, but uh, especially in the 1800s, I mean, there was no... There was no Facebook and there was no uh, yeah. there was no radio. Yeah. Uh, if you were going to get some news, if it didn't come from from Mabel across the street, then it came from the newspaper. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, how many people show up in Punxsutawney for Groundhog Day? We see uh, at, at the most probably in the around forty thousand, and that would be on a on a big weekend. On oh uh, you know goodness. everything kind of the perfect storm happens when it's like the weather's nice and the, and it's and it's you know the right weekend and there's no Super Bowl on that weekend and you know that would be our biggest crowds. And then uh, you know if it was on a Wednesday in the middle of the week, it doesn't make as much sense for people to take off work and and make the trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, but we, I guess... know, we might be more like ten thousand or eight thousand. So it has a big swing, and we, but we've got used to that and kind of know what to plan for you most of the time. So, Well, I was on, in fact, I posted a link to it on today's radio wrap-up. You have like a whole weekend of things because it's on a Friday, so you have a whole weekend full of yeah. things going on in Punxsutawney this year. It's pretty cool for us this year because uh, normal, well, we just came off, it's like you always remember the last three or four years. That's what's ingrained in your brain a little bit when you're in the planning process and stuff. But we just came off a, a handful of years where Groundhog Day was sort of the end of the holiday. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the prognostication happens and everybody goes downtown afterwards and has a bite to eat and hooks around town and there's a couple events going on. But, but by probably three o'clock, everyone's jumping in their cars and uh, heading home or mm-hmm. you know, heading to their next destination. And, uh, yeah, this is different with Groundhog Day being on a Friday, so the uh, prediction is on Friday morning, or, you know, at sunrise. And then, yeah, there's stuff going on all day Friday, all day Saturday, a bunch of stuff Sunday, so, yeah. Where do people come from who come? Well, uh, really all over. I mean, anywhere from uh, as close as uh, I have an aunt that lives, you know, within a mile of Gobbler's Knob. Mm -hmm. Uh, as close as there to as far away as uh, as far away as you can get, basically, uh, and it's it is not even it is not even uncommon. And I mean, it's not like oh my gosh, that's crazy. You're from Australia. It's like okay, this guy's from Australia. This guy's from uh, Ukraine. This guy's from Tokyo. This girl's from uh, Norway. I mean, people come from literally all over the world. Okay. It is. And you'll say, you know, my, my I will always be like, oh, well, what else are you doing while here in the United States? They're like, I don't know. This is what we came for. We're, we're doing Groundhog Day, and you're like, oh, my gosh. You know, it's like always, it always, you know, never ceases to always impress me that, uh, that this is their, this is the reason. You know, it's not like this is a part of the thing they're doing while they're here. Mm. You know, this is, all, for many people, this is the reason they came. I was, and you know, when I, I, I was telling you that after I was there, I got a little obsessed with Punxsutawney stories, reading everything I could find online. And, and I did read that, that people people because of the movie that people are so fascinated and 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 i watched the movie again <laughs> back in uh, october because i because I, I don't remember this and and of course the, the movie was not filmed in punxsutawney but um and, and were you telling me that what, what did you say the reason was that they didn't film it there well i guess what i like to our sort of our tongue-in-cheek answer is that uh you know i guess they didn't feel we looked enough like punxsutawney <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> To be the location for filming, but the real reason is that um, I, I don't know if it was Bill Murray or Harold Ramis or, or, uh, or one or both their families are from out by Chicago, and so Woodstock, Illinois, made a lot of sense it, logistically. It was better, um, and I'm not sure. I mean, sort of the same thing. Like back in those days, no one filmed anything in Pittsburgh, and now everyone, lots of things are being filmed yeah, in Pittsburgh, yeah, yeah. and I think. It could have had it to do with some tax breaks that they sometimes do uh, to lure guys into film stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know that, but sort of in my head, I always think that might have been part of it. Because, I, like I said, I see that happen in Pittsburgh now. It's like you turn around left and right, there's Tom Cruise is a film in a movie, and over here they're filming Batman. And, right, right. And, like, back in the day, we never saw it. I don't think anyone filmed anything since the Deer Hunter until, like, the last 10 years in mm-hmm. Pittsburgh. So, Okay, listen, we need to take a quick break. So please stay with us. You're listening to Victory Chicks Radio, and I'm Anne Marie Kelly. Welcome back to Victory Chicks Radio. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and we're here with AJ Darum. Punk Satoni Phil's handler and rainmaker AJ Darum. So AJ, you know what surprised me when we were when I was there that Gobbler's Knob is not in right in the town at the, the heart of Punk Satoni. You have to drive like back to when they gave you directions. Like drive down here, you go past the Walmart, and then you make a right. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's actually probably the the first thing people notice about or think about when they get here because they always expect it to be in right the town there. square because of the movie because that's the way they did it there. Right. And it just makes more sense that that would, you know, I guess maybe in your in someone's head that makes sense. Why wouldn't it be downtown? But really, when it comes down to it. Uh, we could never handle the crowd downtown. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be one. Uh, number two, uh, where we have it is like a natural amphitheater, so it works really well. But Groundhog Day always took place uh, actually out. This is the the current location is probably the closest it's ever been to Punxsutawney. Mm-hmm. I think it had. I was talking to one of our guys. He's actually our historian. He's one of the oldest guys in the club, and he's just really into it. Uh, his family's been around town for a hundred years, and hmm. he, they were always involved. Uh, but he was saying, like I said, I, I believe there's four locations uh, that it was before it was in its current location. They're all like on, on a knob somewhere out in the woods, and uh, that's sort of that's where it's at now. It's like the highest point, you know, surrounding town. You can actually see the town from up on there. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. If I had knew, known that, I would have looked around more. I mean, I, I did look walk around plenty, but I did. I just didn't. I well, if, there, if, there, the, if there were leaves on the trees, maybe maybe not. But like this time of year, hmm. you have a real nice view of the town. Um, so, so gobblers. So, where did the name Gobblers Knob come from? Well, uh, you had actually. Uh, we had talked. You know, when we talked before, I, I kind of th- thought that might be a question you'd ask. Mm-hmm. And so, I I didn't know, and I did my best to figure that out. And uh, the only thing that I got from anybody was, well. There must have been a lot of turkeys out there whenever they first came up with the name. Yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. That, yeah, that does make sense because it's a But the good, name you know, was part of the historical story of where, when when they originally started writing about it in Punxy Spirit, uh, they referred to the place that Groundhog Day took place and where the, where the prognostication took place as Gobbler's Knob. And the name actually moved with the location of the event. Oh, interesting. You know, when I and when I was there, like we weren't sure because when when um, for all my listeners to know, like when we made that right at, at just after the Walmart and we were driving, and we were like, are we going in the right place? And then all of a sudden there it was. Yeah. And and we we pulled in and we parked and then we walked around because we didn't know what, exactly what we were looking for. And I saw there was like a community room on the property mm-hmm. and there was some kind of meeting going on. And you were telling me that what is now Gobbler's Knob was once a sportsman's club. Right. So, uh, you know, think about these beginnings like, you know, Groundhog Day back. Even uh, my fiance's mother tells me when she would go to the go to Groundhog Day, and this was like, this has been like the 70s, um, you know, her dad would drag her up there. And it was maybe 100 people. So when they would do this uh, at these other locations, it wasn't really anything more than a stump in the woods. It wasn't like a big mm. uh, uh, performance like it is these days. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we, the, 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 the location before where it's at now, they, a church bought the property and built a church there. It's just down the road. And so obviously Gobbler's Knob wasn't going to work there. So they moved it a half a mile down the road to the sportsman's club that had like 200 acres there. It was like a hunting club. And uh, it was the Punks 20 Sportsman's Club. And I think all the Groundhog guys would have probably joined the club at that point. And, and that's where they had it. And they kind of like coexisted up there. Mm-hmm. And as things got bigger... And bigger and bigger. The sportsman's club started thinking we wanted like uh, we. Could, this is sort of conflict of our interest, and and they had an opportunity for another really nice piece of property, so they went and bought that, and and they were going to sell the, the the property the Gobbler's Knob is on, mm. and the, the the guys didn't know what to do, and uh, it ended up it went to bid, and an, another church, and this was like really random, a church from like down in Georgia. Started bidding on this piece of property, and it was really uh, almost Georgia, bizarre. Like who would and cut, who from driving, Georgia? the price was getting driven like uh, way above what our values are around here. And hmm. the guys were pretty much like, "Hey, you know, we we can go and buy another piece of property if we have to for for the, this kind of money." Hmm. It ended up their deal fell through, and a businessman in Punxsy, uh also had his eye on the property. He decided to buy it with the understanding then that he gave the Grand Dog Club a really sweetheart deal on uh, basically the corner of the property that Gobbler's Knob is on. So uh, at that point then, we required, or we acquired the property. That was probably in the 90s, so it wasn't all that long ago. Hmm. And so the property where you have it is, is it, there's, it, and you're right, it's like an amphitheater, and there's a stage, and, and there's a... 
like a railing that goes down to the stage. Mm-hmm. And and I, I was thinking about that myself. Like when I when I was there, there was netting all around the the um, railing, and I thought, oh, this would be a neat place to. Like, this would be a fun. If I was getting married, that would be a fun way of going down the, you know, walking down that because it's beautiful. Yeah, it is a it's a it's a, it is an absolutely beautiful piece of property. I mean, we're really lucky. It's a, this is a beautiful area of the of the country, even. I mean, and you know that sort of. Gobbles Knob is a perfect example of you know Western PA. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of big deciduous trees and uh, nice you know grassy areas and, and everything. But yeah, it's it, it is uh, well. We, I should say because the the Sportsman's Club, we do have that big. There's like a meeting hall there right. uh, that wouldn't really be necessary for our operations, but it was necessary for theirs. And so we acquired that and or inherited that. So lots of people actually do end up having weddings there. And uh, I would actually we we talked about having our having our wedding there, but they're doing uh, or we're going to be doing some renovations this summer, um, which is a whole other story. Uh, so it's going to be under construction. So our wedding mm-hmm. is not going to work there. We had to pick another venue. Yeah, that's a shame because I was thinking how neat that would be to, to to like walk down that aisle to the stage. I it was I thought it was kind of neat. Yeah, it's 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 set. I mean, it's designed for it. So now, AJ, listen. I think most people would be surprised to find out that not only is Phil the most famous groundhog in Pennsylvania, in the world, but he's famous enough to have his own inner circle, and mm-hmm. you're one of them. Yep. So how many people are in the circle? Well, there are there's space for 15 of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are currently 14. Uh, we had uh, um, there, So when you become an inner circle member, um, you must uh, reside in the Punxsutawney area. Which is kind of defined by us at the at the time, you know, as need be. But it, it's what makes sense. I mean, we wouldn't hire some or hire. It's not hire. It's we wouldn't uh, ask someone to to join that lived in Indiana, you know, for example. Mm-hmm. But they might be in the they might be in the next school district over, mm-hmm. just across the line. Or that makes sense. Yeah. sense. So anyway, uh, the only way you get out, if once you're asked to be in, if you decide to accept the the uh, invitation. The only way you get out is to retire or die or move away. So <laughs> this this individual unfortunately died, and he was a he was great. I mean, he'd been a member for a long time, and kind of like our every man. I mean, we we still look around and say, like, oh my gosh, what this thing didn't get done? Who did that? And everyone's like, I don't know. And then they find out it was it was uh, oh. his name was Bob Roberts, and they find out it was him. So he was just a really 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 great guy, and we've had a hard time. Replacing him. Uh, normally, we we elect pretty quickly, uh, but we have uh, this will be the second Groundhog Day without him there, and mm. uh, and uh, we just, we haven't replaced him yet. So if we do have an opening. Oh, so are you all men? Like, can I? Well, I guess I live too far, huh? You do. You live too far, but you could move here. Uh, <laughs> and I uh, know uh, women are eligible just as well as men. Oh, very um, nice. That's so, yeah. good. So, but let me ask you this: Like, what do you in the inner circle do? Like, when in your non-inner circle world? Well, everyone, is, uh, no one in the in the inner circle is. Uh, that's n- nobody. We only have one employee, I guess I should say. It's uh, we have an executive director named Katie Donald. And, and she, she was, like, yeah, she connected like, me with you. She was really yeah, nice. She's she's great. She keep and we didn't always have. Well, we always had someone. We didn't always have someone full time, and uh, she's full time, and. Uh, it's taken us to new levels, and uh, we've, you know it's it's been a really good good thing. But uh, the rest of us all have a day job too, except for I think there may be two or three guys that are actually retired. Um, but yeah, the rest of us there's one guy's a real estate agent, one guy uh, is uh, in the coal business. Uh, I myself am in, in the gas business. Uh, our president's a retired funeral director. Uh, so you, there's a, there's a pretty yeah, good so you all have like regular jobs, and this is a volunteer doing being exactly. part of the inner circle as volunteer. Yep. Yeah. And how long have you been doing it? I've been doing it. I'm, I'll be 39 this year. I got in when I was 31, so uh, this will be my ninth year, I guess. Right? Very nice. My eighth year. Whatever. <laughs> but, and how everyone out there can do the math. <laughs> so how long have you been going to Gobbler's Knob? Like, did you do that as a kid? Well, I, yeah, I started going. So my grandpa. Actually, my great grandfather was in the Groundhog Club prior to there being an inner circle. So anyone can join the Groundhog Club. Actually, you could join it if you want. You just go on our website and and join it, just like you're joining, uh, you know, the uh, the local, uh, uh, you know, whatever yeah, like Elks like, or Eagles Club or yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. 
I mean, there's no stipulations to being a member of the Ground Up Club. You just uh, pay your dues and join, and it gets you privy to some insider tracked information and some some things throughout the year. But uh, the uh, what the heck was that? Where was I going with that? <laughs> oh, I was asking. I was asking it. Um, oh, I don't even remember. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about the Groundhog Club. Oh, oh, I bet oh, oh, how long you've been so, going and how long you've been a member and yeah. what your history was with Groundhog. Yep. So, so my great-grandfather was a uh, member of the Groundhog Club. Then in like the 50s, they, the, the guy that was the president of the club at the time decided they were going to have an inner circle. And that would be like a board of directors to more finely manage Groundhog Day. And he was trying to develop it and take it to some new levels, and he did. He was a big kind of springboard into what we have today, and his name was Sam Light. Him and his actually his wife, Elaine Light, were, were both, I mean, there's amazing stories about them, too. It's, it's a whole, I, sh- I should touch on that after I finish this. But anyway, my great-grandfather was in the Groundhog Club. Then my grandfather was in the inner circle. My father then uh, ended up being in the inner circle, and then I ended up being in the inner circle. And... Uh, so I started going up to Gobbler's Knob when I was probably five years old. My dad would take me up there to see my grandfather. And uh, then, uh, you know, we always, that was a big thing for our family. It was always, uh, you know, we went to see my grandfather, and then he passed away. And a handful of years later, my dad got in the club, and uh, it was still a big deal to us, and we kept going. And uh, it was, it's always, always oh, been a so part of like, my yeah, life. Yeah, in your case, it was like passed down from generation to generation. So that's pretty mm-hmm. neat. Yeah. AJ, we need to take another break. So please stay with us. You're listening to Victory Chicks Radio, and I'm Anne Marie Kelly. Welcome back to Victory Chicks Radio. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and we're here with AJ Darum. Um, AJ, I was wondering, like, what, do, what, how long? I, I do a fundraiser every year, so I know how long it takes to put that together. How, when do you start planning Groundhog for Groundhog Day? And you also do other events through the year, right? Yeah, we do events kind of all year long. Uh, I'd say at least. You know, at least one a month, one big one every couple months probably. Uh, but we basically, if if Katie had her way, our executive director, we'd probably start planning Groundhog Day, uh, you know, on February 3rd. But we usually <laughs> kind of go to, like, radio silence for at least a couple weeks and try to get our wits back around us. Cause yeah, sure. January is kind of crazy. Uh, so once we get Groundhog Day out of the way for the year, we take a couple weeks and kind of no one talks to each other but then we got to we got to get back at it because we literally do start planning right away i mean it just uh you know uh or promoting punks tony phil is kind of a year-round job even though you know it's all about groundhog day uh to us it's all about so become promoting the region and promoting the town and the community and uh and even pennsylvania at mm-hmm. large so so you were saying that you, there were some traditions that that happen what are some of the oddest Groundhog Day traditions that you know of? Well, uh, I'll tell you what. One of the first ones is actually uh, that guy I mentioned, Sam Light. He was the one that started it. So back in the 50s, he decided that, uh, you know, being that we consider Phil to be royalty, and uh, back then they would say, uh, well, he was actually named for uh, King Philip originally. So huh. Uh, huh. Sam decided that, that, that we should wear a tuxedo. To, and a top hat to, to honor Phil, uh, as you would any royalty. And what they, that sort of came from was, uh, you know, back in the day, whenever a dignitary would arrive on the cruise ship uh, or, or, a, or a travel vessel, I suppose, not even just a cruise ship, but a, a travel vessel, uh, he would always be greeted by people in tuxedos. And that was what Sam thought that was perfect. Uh, that was perfect for the hmm. for, for Phil. So that's that's one of our traditions. That translates and top hats to our uh, to our followers. You know, the faithful followers of Phil show up on Groundhog Day every year. Uh, you know, in the thousands and thousands of people, and they all have these crazy traditions. Like the, there's like. Uh, you know, you look through the crowd, and if you're someone that watches it every year, you'll see some of the same hats pop up. There's some people with some pretty intricate homemade hats and uh, costumes, and down to like they stand in the same place every year. Uh, there's I met a group in the crowd one year that uh, they've been coming here for 25 or 30 years. They all are poets, and uh, they write poems about Groundhog Day, and they have a little newsletter and everything. I mean, it's <laughs> and there's all kinds of very unique traditions surrounding Groundhog Day that aren't even known to us. So, 
Interesting. And, and I did, you know what, I did find some of those when I was poking around, even just like in the last couple of days. Uh-huh. I did find, I, I thought, wow, this is really way bigger than I thought. Yeah. Like even, even as obsessed as I was last October, I thought, wow, this is really something. Yeah. Um, do you have, what kind of funny stories, ones that you can share on the air? Do you have a couple of fu- uh, funny stories? Well, uh, yeah, there's, I mean, some, you know, there's, it's, it is still, you know, Phil is still a wild animal, so some crazy stuff does happen. Um, there was one year where, uh, now this would be, our president now used to be the handler, and he, uh, he you know, the, the president at the time uh, was named Bud Dunkel, and Bud knocked on the, on the stump three times with his acacia wood cane, as, as we do, and Bill got down to get Phil out of the stump, and... He opened the doors, and he looked, and he looked up at Bud, you know, kind of over his shoulder, and he whispered, hey, uh, we don't have a groundhog. And oh, my goodness. I guess they say, you know, Bud looked down at Bill and said, well, you better find one, and you better find one quick. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So Bill started digging, and here what had happened, the stump had started to rot, and Phil burrowed deep into the stump and actually underneath it. So uh, Bill just, you know, he he started reaching down through this chewed up wood and uh, into the, you know, in, in, and kept reaching and kept digging and digging. And eventually, I don't know if he latched onto Phil or Phil latched onto him, but he came out with a groundhog. So. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's that's too much. Yeah. That's, yeah. Has Phil ever bitten but, one of his handlers? Uh, he does from time to time. It's kind of like we kind of explain it as um, if you're holding a little kid and when they went down, they're going to start getting squirmy and maybe they'll start fussing a little bit. Feels sort of the same way, and uh, if you try to if you try to hold him for too long, and he's had enough of it, he's probably going to give you a little nip. But usually, it's not like anything. You know, it's not like bone crushing, or mm-hmm. uh, I, I can't even fathom a time that anyone had to go to get stitches or anything mm. like that. But <laughs> well, that's uh, good. <laughs> yeah, but he does. He, he he'll put some pressure on you from time to time. So. Interesting. Um, it's, it's, and I'm wondering, with all the traditions and everything, is there any? Is, has there ever been like a particular story that touched your heart in a certain way? You know, like a touching story. Well, um, I'll tell you what, and I really wish I could remember this kid's name, uh, but there was a kid, um, and I think it was maybe even part of the Make a Wish program. But his, he was. Uh, uh, he he actually celebrated Groundhog Day, and he would like hold his own stuffed Punxy fill up, and like this was a big deal to him. And for his Make a Wish uh, uh, wish, he wanted to meet Punks Tony Phil, and so they set this all up and brought him to Punks Tony, and you know made him a uh, get got him, got him a top hat and kind of the whole nine yards, and did this whole thing with him, and it was oh, neat. It was pretty cool because, you know, I mean, it just shows, like, how how big of a thing the holiday is to some people. And, you know, uh, you know, for very minutes, it was like, and rightfully so, it was like, you know, meeting Santa Claus, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's something. Huh. Um, so can you walk me through Groundhog Day? Like, where where do you all meet? All, well, all of you in Groundhog the inner circle. Day, you mean on on, go, on Groundhog Day morning? Yeah, on that on that morning, because that's because okay. it's like by the time we say it on my news in my newscast here outside of Philly, it's like just just in time for Phil to come out. Right. Now that's a good question. Yeah. So and it is, this is where like a lot of the good times happen. So uh, the knob, the gobbler's knob opens at three a.m. Oh my goodness! It, and people come that early. Well, they do. Uh, there's actually a group of some of the traditionalists, like I said, the, the, the people that are year after year, uh, true, you know, true fans, uh, or I should say, just dedic- you know, fans that have been fans for a long time. That will actually all they're, they're standing at the gate, waiting for it to open at 3 a.m. And when it does, they all run down because they want to get their same spots. And, uh, and and I can tell you they're always there because, I mean, it's to the point now where we all know each other by first names because we see each other every year up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, that happens at 3 a.m. It hmm. starts to fill, you know, people are starting to filter in at that point. And uh, at 4 o'clock, it's kind of going crazy. It's really filling up. Uh, by 5 o'clock, you're almost like, you know, you better be there because it takes time to get – it's dark, you know. So you, you got to get the lay of the land. You might want to get a hot chocolate or get a bite to eat. And you still have to take the time to actually 
work your way into the crowd because it's not like you have a seat, you know, that's reserved for you or something. Hmm. So if you want to be close, it, you know, you got to be early. If you got there, I mean, I can tell you that it never fails every year. After after the part that you guys see on television, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we do some pictures and do some other things, and the place starts to clear out. And, you know, I am usually one of the last guys to get off the off of Gobbler's Knob, and I'll be, like, walking around, you know, walking through the parking lot or something, and a car will pull in, and I'll be like, did it happen? You know, you're like, uh, yeah, like an hour and a half ago. And they're like, oh, man, you know, we we were... We were at a bar in Washington, D.C., and we just decided, what the heck, let's go. Oh we all got goodness. in the car, and we thought we'd make it in time, and we didn't. But it never fails. I mean, every year there's a half a dozen people that that happens to. So, yeah, you got to get here early. <laughs> oh, but anyway, yeah. what we, you know, our time up there, you know, we get our, our guys get there anywhere from midnight to probably 4. And um, basically we spend our time kind of... Uh, cruising the grounds and meeting people and uh, talking to people about Groundhog Day, learning their story and telling our story. And um, probably about about the time the fireworks go off, so sometime around 6 o'clock, which it's a spectacular fireworks display. I mean, if you saw it, you wouldn't even believe that it's going on in Punxsutawney. It's like you'd think you were at, like, Heinz Field or PNC Park. I mean, wow. it's, a, it's a really amazing wow. uh, fireworks display. It's, uh, uh, it's something to see in itself, but about the time of that, the inner circle starts to culminate up toward our, our building, up the, 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 the hall that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, we kind of get our game plan together. I mean, we've already got it together, but we sort of, you know, kind of review what our, our plan is, uh, get in, you know, get lined up because we do walk in a, in a particular order. And uh, so we get ready. They do the uh, national anthem, and then uh, and then and then we do what we call our trek. So we start up there, and 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 the inner circle comes down. There's some local dignitaries, and usually a couple of VIPs. Uh, like we'll have a guest speaker um, that's in town for the weekend. This year it's Larry Rickert, who is uh, um, a news reporter for KDKA in Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. uh, and, and a big part of Groundhog Day over the years. He he's reported on Groundhog Day. He's like kind of like a Phil Connor, uh, you know, like Bill Murray's character from the yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, except for he is. Uh, more of a fan of Groundhog Day than Bill Murray originally was in the movie. So anyway, uh, yeah, we, we all walked down uh, through th- down that walkway that you were talking about uh, that kind of splits the uh, viewing area in half. Mm-hmm. We walked down through there and make our way onto stage, onto the stage. And at that point, that's when what you would see on television sort of picks up. Uh, but at that point, it's rolling fast. I mean, Groundhog Day is sort of like I had heard a guy explain it last night. So it's like a Kentucky Derby. You know, it's, the buildup is uh, is ninety nine percent of the event, and then uh, the actual you know the race takes a couple seconds. Just like uh, yeah, you know, yeah. out of stump doesn't take too long. Well, AJ, it's, it's, our time went so fast, and uh, and we, we need to go. I'm just really curious to ask you real fast: Is your sweetie a hometown girl? She is. She's uh. Punxsutawney born and raised. Her name's uh, Stevie Taylor, and uh, I have to remind her sometimes, but she, you know, I said, you know, you are like, uh, well, I should say this. Okay, so if you watch Groundhog Day, there's what we call the fillets, and they're a group of high school, I think seniors, maybe juniors and seniors that uh, are kind of like our cheerleaders, and they uh, work on the stage and help the guys that are doing the entertainment in the morning and do some dances and a couple other skits and stuff like that. Well, Stevie was a fillette, uh-huh. and she is the first fillette to ever make it from there to the head table at our banquet. So. <laughs> oh, very nice. Yeah. Well, AJ, we have to go, but I wish you and Stevie a lifetime of happiness and prosperity, and thank you for joining us. Have a fun and fabulous weekend. And to all of you, my victory chicks and guys who love us, have a fabulous weekend and come back next week. Thanks for coming today. Chin's on.